it would be um, naturally. So this is a fire history map in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, and you can see the sort of the big fire um, that people always talked about was this Green Meadows fire here in 1993. That was about 38,000 acres. This is the Springs fire in 2013, the fire there. Um, this is the Wolsey fire, 100,000 acres, by far the biggest fire ever to impact the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, and it burned basically half of the national park. So, so really, uh, well, of the natural areas um, within the park, um, like about 40% in the Santa Monica's, but actually in the Simi Hills, it was more like two thirds. So, so really a huge impact. This is what the areas look like in the Santa Monica's after the fire. Uh, this is some uh, a veg plot that some of our veg folks are doing, and you can see there's the post that they use to do the veg monitoring. That's before the fire, and that's the same spot uh, post fire. So there's the post there. There's almost a difference there. You can see <laughs> almost. So uh, pretty pretty huge impact. Uh, definitely very well. Certainly having an impact on smaller species. Pretty hard to study. Um, you know, so things like the reptiles that we talked about and the small mammals. Um, and, you know, that's something that we know happened, so this is an example of a rabbit that died, um, that people just found when they were out there right after the fire. Um, you know, it's hard to get a feel for, for what that is in terms of numbers, but it's, it's probably huge numbers. Um, one thing actually that really can be a big impact is on the streams from fire. So this is actually a, a stream post fire, you can see all the vegetation is burned, and then you have a huge amount of silt dropping into, uh, into the drainage there. Um, and I'll just uh, want to keep going here, but I just mentioned very quickly, this is actually from the Topanga fire in Upper Lang. This is that same stream where we lost the, lost the tree frogs downstream in the urban areas. The one spot where we still have newts in the Simi Hills, uh, but you can see the fire burned like almost 60% uh, of, that, of that watershed. And then here you can see this is the average pool depths at Lion Creek, and after 2005, when the fire happened in the fall of 2005, basically all the pools got filled up, and then this is how many of those habitat stops we were detecting nudes, and you can see basically they were completely uh, gone from that stream for multiple uh, stops after the fire. And this is what had happened, actually, this was a great breeding pool for nudes, and it got all filled in, and then you had a bunch of vegetation grow up in there, so. I won't talk about it, but actually the 2000, the Wolsey fire came through and in a way actually kind of helped, which is kind of interesting and like burned that stuff out. So it's actually a little bit better now, which is interesting. But, um, but then we've actually, and I'll talk about this in a, in a minute in terms of uh, successes, but uh, we've actually been reintroducing red-legged frogs to the Santa Monica's, which is a super exciting project. They come from here. This is our last population. These are the places we put them. You can see all of these places are, are within, the, within the burn area. So this is one of those sites in the spring of 2018 with a nice big pool and we put uh, pens out there that we raised the, the tadpoles in. This is what it looked like after the fire. Um, so just completely eliminated the habitat. There's another pool and there's the pen there. Um, and that's what it looked like post fire. Um, so, <clears throat> so huge impacts on the, on the streams from the fire. And then uh, what about mountain lions? Um, so in general, mountain lions are, are big and mobile, and so they're probably escaping the fire themselves, itself, but not always, actually. So this is a uh, young male, P74, and these are his points um, before the fire, and these are his points during the fire. Uh, basically, we, we lost his signal right about the time the fire went through, and so we assumed that he died in the fire and that his collar was destroyed. This is a picture that, that Jeff took going out there after the fire, and that's what it looked like. Um, and actually, you did see uh, a deer that had died, so some larger animals you know, are not able to, to escape the fire. Uh, this is an interesting animal, um, an adult male, P64, and we could talk about him a little bit more if we want when we when we go over there, but he actually figured out a way through this this long dark tunnel. He's kind of the only one that figured it out to go back and forth under one on one. Um, but during the fire, the green green is his points during the fire. I'm sorry, before the fire, and then during the fire, these red points. 
he moved down close to development in the Oak Park area here, but then he turned around and went back, and probably there was tons of activity and all kinds of stuff going on, and it was in a more urban area. He went back right over the area that had just recently burned right afterwards. Uh, and then he was up here for a couple weeks, and then he died, and it turns out he had burned his paws um, and basically um, starved to death. So, um, so that was <coughs> um, an animal that didn't die directly from burning in the fire, but died as a result of the fire, uh, and that's him there. Um, so I'll just talk a, a little bit more about the fire stuff, and now I want to get a little bit um, to a couple of successes, but then I want to get over to the crossing here. But we, this is from a, a recent paper, and we wanted to look with the mountain lions. Um, they mostly don't die from the fire, but how are they affected in terms of how they use the landscape? So what are they doing before and after the fire? And in particular, we were asking the question of are they taking more risks um, after the fire? And so you can imagine if the fire, as I said, the fire burned like half the park, basically. And so if they're avoiding the fire, um, that's what that might look like. They're more in the areas that didn't burn. And then is that potentially affecting how they're uh, how they're behaving and whether they're taking more risks relative to both humans and relative to other mountain lions. So are they crossing roads more? Are they using urban areas more? Are they more active during the daytime when people are more active? Um, and then are they moving around more because the habitat uh, maybe is not as good and then they might run into other mountain lions like those males that I talked about? Uh, and then is there more overlap if they're not using the burned area? Is there more overlap between animals um, in that unburned area. Uh, and so basically what we found is that they were significantly avoiding uh, the burned area, basically. So this is before the fire, you can see the points are all over the place. That's three months after, uh, three to five months after, five to six months after, uh, and then all the way to nine to 12 months after. You can see still, I mean, mostly, I mean, occasionally they're going through the burned area, but largely staying in these uh, these unburned areas. And so we actually looked at, um, with Rachel, that she's another postdoc, was another postdoc at UCLA, we looked at whether they were avoiding or selecting the burned areas, um, and overall they were avoiding the burned areas, and none of the animals that we studied significantly selected them, uh, and a number of them significantly avoided it. Um, so what about these other, these other behaviors? Uh, we, we, they did increase their number of road crossings from about three per month to five per month. Uh, and in terms of freeway crossings, we were seeing one-on-one -on -one crossings one every two years uh, to one every four months post-fire. Um, we also did see an increase in daytime activity from about 10% to about 16%. Importantly, we did not see a significant change in the amount of urban use. So a lot of people were thinking all the animals are going to like descend into the urban areas post-fire, um, we saw, you know, it went from 4.3 to 5.4 percent. So it's, it's a tiny percent of the time, and basically it didn't increase significantly. Uh, and then we did see increased distance traveled from 250 to 390 kilometers per month. Uh, and then we also saw more home range overlap, and in particular, more overlap of the dominant male with other, with other males increased from 10 percent to 23 percent. Um, and this is kind of what that looks like. These are just males here. Uh, and you can see, again, largely not using the burned area. This is about a year after the fire. And you can see there's a bunch of males here um, overlapping each other. Uh, and so, again, if they're interacting, if they're overlapping, they may be more interacting like that. So, um, this is an interesting story about P61 who crossed the freeway and ended up getting hit and killed on it. I'll just I want to keep going here, so I'll, so I'll skip that, but we can talk about it if you're interested um, later. So just a couple of, of successes to go with all the challenges. Yeah, all good. Um, one is uh, reintroducing California red-legged frogs. Um, so this is a species that was lost in the Santa Monica's, um, well, greatly reduced across the whole, it's actually this, the official amphibian of, of the state of California. They are threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, and like I said, majorly reduced. This is their former range, and this is their current range. And you can see in Southern California, they used to be all through Southern California down into Baja, uh, and they're largely gone from Southern California. And in particular, in the Santa Monica's, we hadn't, they hadn't been seen since the mid-70s. 
Um, but then around 20 years ago, one population was discovered in the, San in the Simi Hills, just north of 101. Um, and so we started a program to bring them back to the Santa Monica's. So starting in 2013, um, we surveyed various streams, or even before that actually found particular sites that were good. We collect half egg masses actually. So this is just something that, that just happened uh, yesterday. Actually, Katie was out moving some egg masses. Um, we grow them up in pens and then we monitor them. So basically, you know, here's the, in the Cena Hills is that last spot. These are all the places that they used to be before the 1970s. Um, we, we collect the egg masses, we drive them across the freeway, and then we put them in these pens uh, in a nice deep pool like that. Um, and then they hatch into tadpoles. We raise them up until they're big enough to not all get eaten by the newts, basically. Um, and then we release them. Uh, and now we have this frog in the Santa Monica Mountains, which we didn't for 40 years, basically. Yeah, every clock, every clock, every clock. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's just pretty cool to go out there and, and see. And they're, they're big, the females especially, like they're huge frogs. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool thing. Uh, one particularly exciting day was um, around, around this time in 2017, we saw our first egg mass in the Santa Monica. So not only have we brought them in, but then they had survived and found each other um, and made it in the Santa Monica's themselves. Um, this is seeing them mating there, so that's the females are bigger, uh, and that's the male. And actually, um, you know, as I said, we had this huge impact on the Red Legged Frog Project, unfortunately, from the fire. But in Solstice Canyon, which is um, one of our sites, which is actually our best site, um, we have continued to see reproduction. That's our least impacted stream. Uh, we had reproduction in 2019, right after the fire, and then we've continued to have it 2020, 21, and 22. We haven't seen it yet this year, but this year was crazy with all the rain and all the streams have been raging rivers, basically. Um, so we'll see. Um, and we still had some frogs post-fire in all the other streams. Unfortunately, as you saw in those other slides, this, the habitat is really pretty terrible there. Um, but we have documented reproduction in all four sites, so we're gonna we're gonna continue to work to try to um, try to recover those streams. And then just the last thing is in terms of, and we'll go out and, and see this in a minute here, but um, in terms of restoring landscape connectivity, um, and there's lots of different projects which I can talk about if uh, we want maybe we're out there or whatever, that we've done looking at different sections of the road. But as I've said, the biggest barrier is 101, separating the Santa Monica's from everything to the north. And so, and actually, it's no longer proposed, that's why I put those, <laughs> put those in quotes. It is now becoming reality, which is pretty awesome, um, is to put a crossing right there in that Liberty Canyon area. Um, this is a picture of crossings, famous crossings in Banff National Park. This is one in Germany. So other places have done this, especially other parts of the world are a little ahead of us on this. Um, although, what do you notice about these two pictures? What do you see on the roads there, or not see? Cars. There's like no cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, whatever. There's some cars sometimes, obviously. But, but that's, do you ever see that on 101? I mean, right? Um, so there's a, a different situation that we have. So one thing is, you can see it's only three lanes there. Um, and that's like a couple lanes in each direction on BAMP. Our crossing is going over 10 lanes, eight lanes of traffic plus an on and off ramp, 350,000 vehicles a day. So one of the busiest freeways on the planet. Um, and in a, as I've been saying this whole time, in the, a large urban area, one of the largest urban areas in the US. Um, and so all those things, as far as we know, are unique. No one has ever tried to put one over such a big freeway or such a busy freeway or in such an urban area. Um, fortunately, there's been a ton of interest and support on this. Um, and excitingly, and like I said, we'll go out and see it, but um, the fundraising was so National Wildlife, we have lots of partners, but one critical one of Caltrans, of course, and Santa Monica Mountain Conservancy, who owns the land, but uh, who Sean mentioned earlier, but Caltrans, I mean, but National Wildlife Federation took this project on and basically raised the $90 million um, that it's costing. And so we had groundbreaking last April, which was a great event. Um, started to do some utility work in the summer of 2022, although 
some acorn woodpeckers were nesting in a power pole, <laughs> which uh, made it uh, slow down a little bit. But construction really began in September, and we'll go see this right now, but in April, we have 10 pillars in the median, and they're working on the abutments on both the north and south side. Um, important to mention that it's not just for mountain lions, so we're making this big vegetated crossing, and it's for everything. Um, and, you know, some species like deer, for example, don't want to go through long, dark tunnels, and so... Uh, and then, as I said, you know, we were seeing those genetic differences from fragmentation for lizards and a bird, and so the goal is to, to connect these whole systems for everything. Um, but for lions, as, I've, as you've been seeing, right, we really think it's, it's critical in the long term for the survival of that species. Um, and then just one um, last thing about rodenticides. There has been a lot of efforts. This isn't something we do, like we do the science and we share it with people, but Lots of different folks at different levels. So at the local level, this group called Poison Free Malibu has gone to individual stores and asked them to stop selling them. Um, various counties have significantly reduced their use. The state, California Department of Pesticide Regulation has changed the regulations. And then nationally, EPA has also done some things, although we still continue to see a lot of exposure in the mountain lions. So all these things haven't completely solved it. So yeah, that's the end. Cool. Thanks. Awesome.